I was really happy with the business speakers that we had uh, for this year. Why and we've gotten set up in the you folks been in the business track all day for the most part? Yeah. Okay. Really above average quality uh, business track speakers. So really happy about that. And when we saw all the folks come in, we thought, let's put a panel together of uh, some of our uh, business speakers and let you guys ask some questions and I'll ask some questions and we'll go from there. So my name is Nathan Ingram. I'm the lead organizer here at WordCamp Birmingham. I'm also a coach for WordPress freelancers and uh, I love the business tracks at WordCamps. That's usually where I speak and I've gotten to know a lot of these folks over the years. And uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off letting them introduce themselves and then I've got a few questions to kind of get the conversation started and then we'll open it up and let you guys ask questions. Is that okay? And we'll go for 45 minutes or so. All right, so let's start down here at the end with Mickey. Mickey, uh, what you guys are gonna do is tell us who you are, where you're from, uh, a little bit about your business and uh, kind of the stuff, what you do in business. All right, my name is Mickey Trivet. I own Web Radio San Enterprises. Uh, we are out of Tri-City, Tennessee, also known as Jonesboro. It's in the very tip top of Tennessee, a uh, very small community. Um, I've been in business since 2004, and I do website design, full color printing, consulting, and all that good stuff. Uh, love what I do. Did I forget anything? No, good. I'm Melanie Adcock, uh, Adcock Creative Group. I just recently, as of like last week, merged with my husband. Um, I used to be MGA Creative Designs on my own, so we emerged. He's also a freelancer. Uh, we're out of Newton, Georgia. Uh, I've been doing uh, freelancing since probably 2003, but uh, WordPress, WordPress freelancing since 2010. Uh, my specialties are church websites and uh, retirement communities, but I've done a little bit of everything. I'm Gordon Seigert. My two companies are Copperleaf Creative and Press Managed. At Copperleaf Creative, we build websites for clients with purpose, on purpose. And at Press Managed, we give our clients the peace of mind of a sleeping puppy by giving them a single neck to ring, mine, if anything goes wrong, and um, they can just call us and, and get it taken care of. We run out of Loveland, Colorado, which is about an hour north of Denver. And I've been building websites full time on WordPress since 2008. Hi, I'm April Weir. I run a digital marketing agency um, in North Metro Atlanta called Sugar Five Design. And we work with um, growing businesses who want to grow faster. We do web design, SEO strategy, and business co uh, coaching. And um, we are very involved in the local WordPress community. And we just really, really love. Uh, going to meetups and camps and supporting the community. Awesome. So, uh, how many of you folks are, you, have, you own a business, you're working with clients, that's your thing? Uh, All right, awesome. So, how many of you struggle with pricing your websites? <laughs> More or less. All right. How many of you at one time or another have charged far less than you should have for a website? <laughs> so, yes. Just free camp. <laughs> uh, so that's the next question. I would like each of these folks to tell us what is the least you've ever charged to build a website for somebody. Okay. The very first website I got paid to do, I got paid $99, and it was live for five years. Whoa! <laughs> okay, you want to talk about long-term value to a client? <laughs> That's 20 bucks a year in development. Now, I don't know if it was a good website or not, but wow. Yeah. Um, the, the cheapest website I ever bid was 200 bucks for a restaurant. Um, I got lucky they didn't say yes. The, the, the cheapest one I actually got paid for that stands out in my mind uh, was pre-WordPress for me. It was an OS commerce build, full e-commerce, for 800 bucks. Anybody ever use OS commerce? God bless you. Okay. Uh, other than the ones uh, before I was a freelancer that I actually did for free uh, when I was a teacher, and I did one for my school, um, the, the least I've gotten paid is around $500, and the site is still live. So, yeah, and it is pre-WordPress, so... Um, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, the least. I've done a free website for a nonprofit, so I guess that would be the least. 
but the least I've done paid for would be the very first website I ever sold was $500. Uh, and that was on a dirty word that we're called Joomla. So. <laughs> Do you know that's a wonderful, and they're the stepchild of the open source community. We love you. Uh, so can anybody think $99 for a website? I think that's that's awesome. That's a dubious price. That is, yeah. 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 So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the funny thing about that is, is that it was awful, it was ugly, it was awful, it was ugly, but it ranked and it got the guy a lot of business and he it was ranked able to as in on Google or as in Well <laughs> no, no, no. No. <laughs> All right. So that's the least you've ever charged. April, why don't you start again and tell okay. us the most the largest dollar wise project you've been involved in? Well, I specialize in brochure sites. The largest price point that I really usually go to is around 6,500. Unless we're doing like something really super fancy, uh, I, that's as high as I go. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think you, you don't actually have to spend, have to charge a lot of money to be profitable. You just have to have really, really good processes. Exactly. Yeah, good. We'll get into that. Yeah, that's not about the, the dollar sign. It's about the margin you have in it. Yep. Um, that said, I have two part answer again. Um, I recently bid between $180,000 and $240,000 for work in the next 12 months with a client. Um, we both know, me and the client, not all that's going to go through, so that doesn't really count. Um, the most that's ever cleared through was a phased project, um, and that added up to just shy of $35,000. Uh, it was actually last month, the client signed it, $23,000 uh, for a website that's about... Uh, well, actually, it's twenty-three thousand for the main website and five thousand dollars for each satellite website. So that's going to be about a thirty-five thousand dollar project when it's all done. Um, and I just knew that they had deep pockets, so I just kind of pulled the, the, the amount out of the air <laughs> and they signed it. So I probably didn't charge enough. Um, with me, it would be uh, around thirteen five, I believe. So. Um, and that was a pretty good bit of back. And, uh, yeah, it was about $13,500 for me. And so the, the point of asking those two questions is to show you the range where people kind of started, $99, up to, you know, 30, you know, Melanie started at 500 to 30 something thousand dollars. So there's a lot to be learned in the, 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 the journey between a $500 website and a $23,000, could be $30 something thousand dollar website. Uh, there's a lot to be learned. Yeah, yeah, bring it down there. So my largest client, I started off on a $350 a month retainer, and they are now $68,000 a year client. So, Starting small doesn't always mean ending small. Either. No, that's, that, that's, that's such a great point. And, you know, the, the most important dollars I think you can earn in a WordPress business are the recurring dollars. It's, that is where the priority has to be. So, you know, there, there's a, a journey, like I said, between starting out in the $500 range where a lot of folks start out. Anybody start out around, that's kind of where you started, roughly there, $500,000, somewhere in there. Yeah. And then charging a lot more. There's a lot of aches and pains, business growth, a lot of stretching that has to happen. So let me ask you guys, what in that process, what's been the biggest mistake you made in your business? The biggest mistake? The biggest mistake um, in my business. Well, before I deal with that, I want to say something else about the pricing. What I've noticed in the pricing is the lowest paid client that I have is the worst Yes. So I don't know if you agree with that, but (laughs) so I just think we need to bring that to the focus as well. But the biggest mistake I've made in my business was not hiring help sooner. Uh, It cost me so much money because my business tripled when I hired help. Uh, So it makes me think, you know, what if I would have hired help when I first started versus when I did ten years later? Look at the amount of money I could have made, could have, should have, would have, but instead I didn't. I was stuck on, hey, I can do this, and nobody else can do it like me. Boy, that was a shooter up in town, so don't be like me. Biggest mistake. That was the biggest mistake. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Mine's probably two points. One is uh, being afraid to talk about money up front. Um, I used to be like, you know, Oliver, you know, can I please have more? 
Um, so uh, it's like the top three questions, what's your budget? I am no longer afraid to ask them. Being afraid that they wouldn't have a big budget and uh, then I'd lose the job, it's not a, not a problem for me anymore to tell them, tell them no, I'm not, not the person for you. I, I don't work that, at low budget projects like that. Uh, the second thing um, is not having a process for everything. Because if you have a process for everything and you stick to your processes, it just makes your life so much easier. Before you pass it, let me dig into one of those answers you just gave. Um, you said that um, you know, in your, your first mistake was, what was it? Um, not talking about money. Yeah. So how do you learn? Talking about money is tough, right? With blanks. How do you learn to talk about money? Well, you taught me. <laughs> Um, you and WP Elevation um, taught me about um, not being afraid to ask about your budget. And if they say they don't have a budget, so I said, so you have an unlimited budget. Money's no object. <laughs> and that is a great thing to get a number like that. Well, I'm thinking about, you know, $2,000. Well, you're not going to get an e-commerce site for that. Um, you know, then you can kind of ask as WP Elevations, go wide, go deep. Start asking what they want and why, and why, and why, and what else, and you get down to the nitty gritty, and they may not have the budget then, but then you can break it down into phases, which I did with a the client. They didn't have the money up front for e-commerce, but you still need a website, so let's start with a brochure website, and then once your business picks up, let's go add the e-commerce. So you end up still keeping the client, but breaking it down, and then you now you're guaranteed they're gonna come back to you for phase two, phase three, and they end up being Great. Gordon, biggest mistake? Biggest mistake was hiring too soon. <laughs> um, and actually, it built on both of those. My biggest mistake was hiring staff too soon. It led me to run the business upside down for over six months, meaning I was losing money every single month. I was busting my tail, paying my staff out of my pocket and racking up debt. That is the worst thing you can do. And the reason that it was too soon is that I didn't have the processes. It was your same mentality, I do this, I'm amazing at this. How do I outsource that or how do I insource that? How do I have staff do what only I can do? So that put me in a really bad spot. Um, we're probably gearing up to start hiring again in the next year or two, but this time it'll be um, processize everything, but that isn't to say get it down to every single click and screenshots and videos, because if you make it idiot proof, only idiots will want to work with it. Um, that's actually a quote from the CEO of Netflix, roughly, you know, repeated. Um, but the process of this is, these are the steps you go to figure it out. You know, for example, the WordPress troubleshooting process. Turn off all the plugins but the one that you think doesn't work, then turn off the theme. It's not what button, what plugin, it's the bigger process. Uh, I also waited too late to get my processes in order. So everything was a bespoke design solution for each um, client. And that doesn't, I mean, it sounds great, but in uh, reality, it doesn't work and it does absolutely doesn't scale. So um, if you don't have processes, get them now. <laughs> and you have processes, they're just in your head and they need to be on paper or you know on your computer. Um, but I think, for me, um, on a bigger picture, is one of the big mistakes that I made was um, allowing my people-pleasing people personality to affect my business decisions. And so I would take consequences, business consequences of my clients, and I would absorb them. Okay, So my client wouldn't have the budget to do it, and I would do it, and I would absorb the difference. Or they would make a bad decision, and break their site, and in the middle of the night, I would fix it, okay? That's absorbing their consequences that they should be absorbing. And that's, you know, of course that, you know, can uh, ripple out through the rest of your life, um, but once I got that in order and started respecting my business and started putting appropriate boundaries around what I'm responsible for and what they're responsible for, because a lot of us care more about our client sites than they do. <laughs>
right? That, that is, that's a tweetable. Oh yeah. Uh, a lot of us care more about our clients' sites than they do, which is absolutely true. I mean, I would totally agree. Uh, so all of you guys have mentioned something about processes. Um, and this is just kind of open for anybody that wants to volunteer. What do you mean by that? Processes. Well, I, the my way we do our processes are the things that we do repeated tasks or methods or philosophies that we go, um, that we do our work by. So um, in the beginning, it was all in my head. Um, but when I got ready to do um, what I call a process book, because I don't want to be in my business forever. I want to have my business running forever, but I don't want to run my business forever. So um, I actually hired a VA, and she's fantastic, and we started doing process workshops. And so we would spend time, and I would just brain dump, and then she would um, organize it and show it back to me, and then we would create repeatable processes for other people based on that. And it was really amazing because it was such a confidence builder for me because seeing what I knew and what I did for my clients not only validated my value that I was bringing to them, but now I can duplicate that value without me having to do everything. Uh, wonderful. I'm so going to get my VA to do that. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Do that. Um, I'll jump on something really simple and looks smaller. Checklists. Mm -hmm. Checklists save you from errors of ineptitude. Um, what that means is something you knew you had to do, but you just forgot. It's not that you didn't know, but there's you know eight, nine, ten things in a row. Maybe you did nine out of ten, but that tenth one matters. <laughs> so uh, for me, the book was the Checklist Manifesto. Yeah, it's a great yeah. yeah, it thinks it's about the World Health Organization, but it's not. Um, and and my fun story on that is that I ordered a a uh, sitting standing desk, and they've asked me not to use their name. Um, and when I went to check out, the options were credit card or test checkout. I went, well, that's interesting. So I went through their test checkout. And like a lot of us developers, we know the Visa test card number. It's not a secret, it's four, followed by 15 ones. And so I checked out, and I fully expected that they were going to send me an email that says, hey, nice job, Bozo, you can't have your desk. But instead, I got a payment confirmation, I got a shipping confirmation, and I got a desk. And then we took pictures of us putting it together, and never where we put it in the office, and I wrote a blog post about errors of ineptitude and this book and what had happened. And then I emailed them the blog post. And I said, listen, guys, I had no intention of stealing a desk from you. I'm going to pay for it. I just thought you should know. And uh, they called me and said, listen, take our name off that blog post, and we'll give you the desk at half price. And I said, this is not extortion. I'm not blackmailing you. I'm paying for the desk. Um, in the end, we settled. I did take the, the name off the blog post. And I don't think we could replicate what I did. They, they, they turned off test, test checkout. It wasn't like they hacked anything. <laughs> but they seemed to think it was a security problem. I'm like, no, you need checklists. Um, yes, yeah, so, and, and then later, this is really ironic, I had a client read that blog post and then come back to me with a screenshot of the admin panel where I had left the box that said, discourage search engine indexing. Checked oh. for nine months. And, that, and they walked in and said, Gordon, you made an error of ineptitude. This is your blog post, this is our admin panel. And I went, oh, you're right. So really, basically, my checklists are a reminder of everything I've ever screwed up ever. So when you screw something up, it goes on a checklist. And now we go and we check all the boxes. And everything went up perfect, we make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, we make it right. You know, I, I credited an awful lot of money to that client, and they're still a good client. I'm a, also big, I'm a list person. I love lists. I love Trello because it's lists. Um, so mine are checklists. Checklists for what to install on a website. Um, I have processes for uh, actually even scoring clients that come to me. I work most just by referral. So if I have a, a cold call from a client, they have to pass a test. I actually score them. If they don't pass that, I pass on the project. Um, because I don't want to work with uh, PETA clients, um, pain in the asterisk clients. Um, uh, if, if they really, you know, sound like it's going to be a neat project, um, you know, then you just charge them a whole lot more to work with them. Uh, 
but I know when you're first starting out, you don't have that luxury. I, I have the luxury to say no, and uh, that's what having a business coach has. You know, you've got the permission from somebody, you know, smarter in the or farther along in the journey to say it's okay to tell people no. Um, but processes, I love checklists and launch checklists um, simply because of that very reason. Turn, uh, making sure that uh, the test mode is turned off. I actually thought, oh, this is such an easy small site I launched yesterday. Um, I don't need to go by the checklist. <laughs> and I went in there last night and I had still had it on test mode for um, checkout. Lucky she only had one product, so I didn't think the whole world was going to try to buy this product. So, but I thought I went through the checklist and I'm like, oh, I forgot to do that, and that was on my list. So, uh, have have a process for everything that that's important in your step to go through, even bringing on clients, what you need from them, sending them the list of what you need. I have to write it all down because. I'm not, you know, 29 anymore. I can't remember everything. So having that list in front of me that I can, that box on Trello that I can check that I've done it, and I move on to the next task. And that way I can go to bed and sleep at night, and I don't wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning going, <gasps> did I forget to do that? So um, just having a process for it. If it's not on the list, it does not exist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, you know, go with pretty much everything they said since I'm the last guy, and that's pretty much what I do as well. Um, I use Trello as well, uh, but one of my things too that I do is how many of us have, like, one of the things I've screwed up the most of is contact forms. How many of us forgot to change the email where it goes to launch or launch? <laughs> so that's like number one on my checklist. And number two is do I really want this client as a client? You know, and, and, and that's where, you know, I, I got into that mode of every client's not my client. And then I go down to the launch and stuff like that as well. Um, but another thing that I do is I have personal goals that I want to do every day. And I don't have a list of 10 goals. I write down two or three goals a day that I want to get done. Because it's easier to get two or three things done than it is to get 10. So, you know, and I want it to be able to be reached. And, uh, and that's what I do. So, along with some of the stuff they've said as well. Awesome. Uh, let's open up for some questions here. Yes, sir. Uh, you're probably way past this, but when you pitch a client, uh, what, what deliverables do you offer? So for the, the video and for the room, the question is, when you're pitching a, a client project, what are the deliverables that you offer? And are you after what? It, well, uh, what, what do the clients normally want? They, they want results. They want beauty. They want aesthetics. I mean, what do most of them, what, what triggers do you think? get you the job. So my number one thing is they want to return the investment. So I mean they will get to work and get business in the world. Um, whatever that entails, whether it be optimization, whether it be good content writing, whatever is needed is what they want. Um, but that's, you know, every clock's different. I mean I don't really know how you can say exactly whatever the literal is. Uh, Y'all do feel free to check in. But that's, uh, that's what I say. Anybody else? I get that information in the client interview. Uh, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about tomorrow in my presentation on writing proposals and what you put in them. But uh, uh, you know, you have to keep asking what do they want because most of the time they don't know what they want. Uh, the, the brand new websites that you build because they have to have a website because they're really not considered a legitimate business unless they have a website. So it may just be a brochure site. They don't need it. I just need a website. Well, uh, and farther along, it might be that they need landing pages to sell a specific service. Um, you know, what do you want? If they're a church, uh, you know, what do you want them to see on the homepage uh, for new visitors that are looking for a church? Uh, it's, you know, times, directions, um, what kind of worship do you have? How do, I, how do we dress? What do you have for my kids? Versus, um, you know, a retirement community that you want them to know that you do uh, the full level of services for retirement communities from independent living all the way down to skilled nursing. So uh, it, it all depends on what the client is and you listen to them and and then you, in the proposal, feed it back to them. So you, and mark those as the target needs that you're going to solve, the problems that you're going to solve. 
Um, it's not, um, I'm going to install this plugin and configure it. It's what problems are you solving? But you don't quantitatively give them, you know, I can get you X amount of. Oh, no, 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 no. Actually, I'll jump in on that. So it's largely, I agree with almost everything you said, except for the detail that I like to add, which is it has to be measurable. So that if they say, you know, we're getting two contact requests a month, I want 10, I can measure that. And six months down the road, it's hard to measure beauty. You know, you're excited about my fancy new website, but that's not really what you wanted. So uh, again, to roughly quote someone else, I believe it was Brennan Dunn, um, who said, keep asking clients questions because one of two things is gonna come out of their mouth, money or BS. Keep asking <laughs> questions until you get to the money. And, and that's it, is you gotta set all those things. Ask them what their deliverable that they want, then ask them how they plan to measure that, and then echo it right back in the proposal. Right. So Gordon, would you ever promise uh, 10 contacts per month in a proposal? No, never, because we don't control the internet or the universe, but we agree, we are working together to hit this goal, and we're gonna evaluate it at six months. And if we're at 12, that's awesome. And if we're at eight, let's figure out why and what we need to make better. But you can use language like, uh, we're going to increase your leads. You know, we're going, we're going to set things up and this is how we're going to try to increase your leads. We're going to do, you know, slide in uh, email sign up forms. We're going to do a free giveaway. We're going to, you know, you, you come up with a strategy to increase. Mm -hmm. exactly. And I would say that that kind of goes back to who owns the consequences of the website, who owns, the business, right? So is it my responsibility to make sure your business succeeds? Because that's way outside the scope of building a digital marketing platform, right? <laughs> so um, what I try to do is I try to go to where the pain is. So if they're experiencing pain and we can define why they're experiencing that pain and we can craft a solution to alleviate that pain, that's worth money. And, and let me just reflect for a second because the answers that you just got are not about building a website. They're about running a business. They're about running a business. And there's a lot of what we are asked to do as web developers that falls much more under the hat of business consulting than it is building a website. And those are two totally separate services. You may be able to build a website. You may be able to offer some business consulting. Sometimes people just need a sounding board. But those are two separate services, so make sure you're charging for both. I have a when people ask you what you do for a living, you do not build websites. You own your own web design company. That's a huge difference in perception than I'm sitting in my basement in my pajamas building a website versus which you, may be. Which you, which you, you certainly are. I do make a, a rule to get dressed every day. I wake so, <laughs> but I can't guarantee I'm not in my pajamas in the evening. Uh, working on websites, but uh, there's a whole uh, perception about that. So get yourself out of that where they perceive you being in the basement, you know, working on, on a project versus that you, you are actually operating your own company. Yeah, that's a great point. Yes. yes, nobody will ever respect your business more than you do. Mm. Another tweetable. Tweetable, two for two. Mm. All right, questions? No. Um, Going back to what you were saying about clients messing up your site and you fixing it in the middle of the night, how do you determine who gets access and how you lock it down so that that doesn't happen? So I am kind of a jerk about this. So I am very, I'm very generous to my clients, but I have very strong boundaries. So there's a warranty period, and I believe that my clients should have total access to what they own, but they also own the consequences of access to what they own, right? So I used, I don't do this anymore, but I used to um, have a crack the box uh, clause. So you know like when you buy a PC and you crack the box, you void the warranty. So I would give them admin access and then editor access. And if they logged in with admin access during the warranty period, they voided the warranty. Um, I've kind of dialed that back again, but I reserve the right to reenact it at any time. <laughs> don't, don't take it out. Keep it in. Ours is actually quite similar in that we create a client-level access, 
And the way we describe it is I try to remove the things where you're more likely to hurt yourself than do what you intended to do. And so we turn all those off. And that way they get really easy access to posts and pages and forms and the stuff they should be interacting with every day. And then, and it's all written in a dashboard widget that we made. And then it says, hey, at the end of the day, this is your site. We will give you full admin access. But if you break it, we will fix it. And that's billable. And it says that in their dashboard every time they log in. For me, it depends on if they're if I'm building it, they're not going to be in a website care plan, um, and I'm just handing it off and walking away. Yeah, I give them admin rights. I still um, they don't know this. I have the website backed up. Uh, usually, it's monthly for the people who aren't aren't on uh, care plans. Um, to my Amazon S3, they probably never even notice it goes there because that has saved and made me the hero so many times where they have broken something really, really badly. And I'm like, well, I have a backup from you know two weeks ago. I'll just re you do. And I'm like, well, you know, we have to we have to plan for emergencies. So I put it back up. I come across as the hero, um, and you know we go on from there. For my care plan clients, I, I give them an admin account and tell them never to use it unless I die. Um, and then uh, they get editor access. Advanced Access Manager allows me to give them access to things that, like forms and things that they normally wouldn't get as an editor, um, but they don't get to do things like plug-in updates and things like that because I want to I want to control that and make sure everything's working. Um, but they do own it, and I do give them the admin, but you know, I tell them not to use it. So uh, I'm just like Gordon. Um, I give full access if they request it. If they don't, I set it up to where it's quite controlled and they can't break anything and, and tear it up. Um, I do do backups of everything. Every, uh, I think I've got to set on there a database backup every day. Um, all my clients do not know that, but I don't really want to have to do all the extra hard work if they screw something up. So I have it there to help them. Um, but you know, I mean, I had a client, for instance, and his password was one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> he got hacked. And really? No. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and uh, anyways, I told him, I was like, this is your fault. He got billed for it. And uh, he wasn't really happy, but guess what? He signed up for my piece of mind package right after that. So uh, it worked out really good for me. But uh, like I said, I do pretty much what he says he does as well. So. So on that subject, uh, I'll actually be doing a webinar on iThemes training. iThemes is one of the sponsors of the event today. <clears throat> on iThemes training in a couple weeks called Preparing a Site for the Client. It's free. So if that's something that you're interested in and you want to see a process for that, it's training.ithemes.com. And you can join us for that in a couple weeks. Another question? Yes, sir. Maintenance plans versus um, you, you break it, you pay for it. What are your thoughts on both sides of that? Basically, I'm going to charge you twenty dollars, whatever a month, and I will then take care of whatever happens. Versus, I'm not going to charge you anymore after I build this, but then you're going to pay for everything that you need me to do. So let me shake that question a little bit. Uh, hourly work versus having some sort of a maintenance recurring yeah. package for your clients. Yeah. Uh, if you have a package, maybe tell us what that involves. How do you balance that without it? Yeah, so I do have a peace of mind package, that's what I call it, it's peace of mind, because I want my clients to have a peace of mind. If they elect to do this, I don't require it, if they elect to do this, then they are waived from ever having to worry about their website because that's what it is, it's peace of mind. If it goes down, I get it up. If they break it, I get it up. If they tear it up, I get it up, period. And in the way I sell that to those clients is I'm like, do you have a car? Yes. Get the whole change. Yes. Why not do the same thing for your website? Let's maintain your website and keep it up to date and keep everything fixed to where everything doesn't happen. You invested this much money in it. Why not do that? Um, now, if they go in and break it and they don't have a maintenance plan, then I charge them by the hour to fix that. The conference. Who still has a session yet to come? <coughs> Melanie, what is, your, what is your session? Crafting the perfect proposal, 10 a.m. tomorrow. 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. So we'll be back bright and early Sunday morning. Check out Melanie's session on proposals and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for coming. Thank you.